So in this third and final part of the presentation, we're going to take a look at the Black-Scholes option pricing model or formula. And what we'll see is that the Black-Scholes option pricing formula rests on an analysis that is very similar to the arrow de Bruyne analysis that we've worked through in parts one and two before, wherein we go from the prices of complex assets like stocks and bonds to contingent claims prices, and then from contingent claim prices to the pricing of other complex securities. Although when the Black-Scholes formula was originally derived, Black and Scholes, uh, the economists who came up with the formula to begin with, they skipped the intermediate step of finding contingent claim prices. Instead, they went directly from the prices of stocks and bonds to the pricing of options. Today, however, their famous formula is recognized as being very closely related to arrow de Bru pricing formulas. And as a matter of fact, one can think of the Black-Scholes formula is emerging out of a special case of or an application of arrow de Bru, no arbitrage pricing theory. Here is just a, a little bit of information regarding the history of thought. Uh, the Black-Scholes formula was developed by the two economists who gave the theory or the formula its name, Fisher Black and Myron Scholes, although around the same time, Robert Merton, a third economist, presented an alternative derivation of the same option pricing formula so that in the minds of most financial economists and financial market participants who use this option pricing theory, the formula itself is associated equally with these three names, Black, Scholes, and Merton. We talked a little bit about this in class. It turns out that the rules associated with the Nobel Prize in economics mean that the prize is never awarded posthumously. It's always awarded to economists who are uh, alive at the time that the award is granted. And sadly, this has meant that in a number of uh, occasions, economists who have made important contributions to the development of a particular theory or the development of a particular area within economics have not uh, been able to receive uh, the recognition in the form of a, a Nobel Prize that they probably do deserve. Uh, one instance uh, of that was for the capital asset pricing model where William Sharp won the Nobel Prize partly for the contributions that he made uh, coming up with the capital asset pricing model, but sadly, two other developers of the CAPM, uh, John Lintner and Jan Mawson, had passed away before the Nobel Prize was awarded for that work. And similarly, in this particular instance, sadly, Fisher Black passed away just a couple of years before Scholes and Merton won for developing uh, the Black-Scholes option pricing, the Black-Scholes-Merton option pricing formula, but uh, Fisher Black definitely played a key role in the development uh, of this theory on par with the contributions of the two others. And here in particular are the two famous papers, as you can see, published one right after the other in the early 1970s. Black and Scholl's paper appeared in the Journal of Political Economy in May-June 1973, Merton's in the Bell Journal of Economics and Management Science shortly thereafter, also in 1973. So notice that the publication of these two papers predates the publication of the articles that we discussed in part two of this presentation by Breeden and Litzenberger and Bonds and Miller, which appeared in the late 1970s. And therefore, what we're not going to see in this particular analysis is the kind of analysis that the users of the Arrow de Bru framework work through or use today, where they go from the prices of complex securities to the prices of contingent claims and then back to the prices of complex assets. Instead, what Black and Scholes and especially Merton did is to demonstrate that if we know 
the behavior of the prices of two complex securities, in particular a stock and a bond, we can make inferences using similar reasoning about the price at which an option on the underlying stock should trade. So to see how this theory works, let's start with a simple example in which we think about two periods. Today, period t equals zero, the end of the investment horizon, period t equals one, maybe that's in a year from now. And let's go back to the simplest structure for the way that uncertainty appears to investors in this environment by imagining that now there are only two states looking ahead from today to the end of the investment horizon. Call them a good state and a bad state. Down at the bottom of this slide, some notation is set up. Let's let P0 be the price of a stock at time zero. And let's imagine that the stock can either go up or down or maybe up by a lot or end up by not as much. So PG is the price of the stock in the good state a year from now. PB is the price of the stock in a bad state a year from now. RF will be our risk-free interest rate, the rate paid by bank account balances or a money market fund or government bonds. And then let's let pi be the probability of the good state coming about at t equals one. And because there are only two states at time one, if pi is the probability of the good state, one minus pi has to be the probability of the bad. In these simple two-date, two-state models, we've used event trees to describe the payouts on various risky assets, and we can do that again. It'll be helpful. Here is the event tree describing the price and the payout for the stock. So the idea is that the stock price is P0 at time t equals 0, and then with probability pi, it goes to PG, and with probability 1 minus pi, it goes to PB a year from now or whenever time t equals 1 might be. Now, in addition to the stock, let's consider a call option. And remember, a call option is an option that gives the holder the right but not the obligation to purchase a share of stock at a pre-specified price called the strike price, usually denoted by K, between today and some pre-specified expiration date in our simple two-period setup that would have to be period t equals 1. So let's let v0 be the price or the value of the call option at time 0. And what option pricing is all about is trying to figure out the right price to pay for a call option like this one at time 0. And let's let cg be the payoff generated by the call in the good state at time 1. cb is the payout generated by the call in the bad state. And to begin, let's imagine that no matter what, the call is in the money in both states at time t equals 1. So that means that the strike price has to be below the actual price of the stock in both the good state and the bad, meaning that the payout generated by the call in the good state is given by PG minus K, since the call will allow the holder to purchase a share of stock for K and immediately sell it for PG in the good state and purchase the stock at price K and immediately sell it for price PB in the bad state. So the payoff generated by the call in the bad state is going to be PB minus K, again, operating under the assumption that the call will be in the money, will be worth something in both states of the world at time t equals 1. Here then is an event tree that describes the payouts on the call with probability pi. The good state comes about. The call is worth PG minus K with probability 1 minus pi. The bad state comes about. The probability is PB minus K. V0 equals question mark that highlights our problem, our option price and problem. We wish to figure out at what price should the call option trade for today. Now, of course, we can easily compute the expected payout is the probability weighted average of the cause payout in the good state and the bad, but we can't use the expected payout as our estimated option price 
for reasons that we talked about before. This goes back to the uh, correction, so to speak, of Pascal's analysis from the 1600s that Bernoulli made later on in the 1700s and that von Neumann Morgenstern expected utility theory is all about expected payouts, valuing securities using expected payouts in, ignores the important element of risk aversion. We need to correct the option price V0 for the effects of risk to recognize the fact that as of date zero, the payout at time t equals one is uncertain. But one of the key insights that underlies the development of the Black-Scholes option pricing formula is that we actually do not need to make any specific assumption about preferences or Bernoulli utility functions or even the nature of aggregate risk to price the option. Instead, we can use a very clever no arbitrage argument that replicates the payoffs on the option using a portfolio of the stock and the risk-free bond and recognizing that since risk is already reflected in the price of the stock, we can use information in the price of a stock to figure out what the right price for the option should be. So let's begin the algebraic analysis that will tell us how. What we'd like to do now is to construct a portfolio that consists of shares of stock and a position in, let's now think about the risk-free asset as a government bond that say costs a dollar today and pays off one plus RF dollars for sure a year from now, regardless of which state comes about. And we want to form the portfolio of the stock and the bond in order to replicate the payoff on the option. And again, still assuming that the option will be in the money no matter what at time t equals 1. That means replicating the payout PG uh, minus K in the good state and PB minus K in the bad state. So suppose that our portfolio, our replicating portfolio, consists of S shares of stock and B bonds. Down at the bottom, I've written down the two equations that we would like our portfolio to satisfy. The payout in the good state must equal PG minus K. And if we buy S shares of stock and B bonds, the payout from the portfolio will be S times PG plus B times 1 plus RF will get 1 plus RF back at time t equals 1 for each dollar we invest in the bond at time 1 and for each share of stock that we purchase at time 0 we're going to get PG dollars back at time 1 and then similarly in the bad state S times PB that's the payout from the stock B times 1 plus RF, that's how much we're going to get back from our investment in the bond, and the payout from the portfolio must equal PB minus K if we wish to use this portfolio to replicate the payout on the option. So you may have guessed this already when you were looking at the last slide. What we have now is a set of two linear equations and two unknowns. PG is something that's known in advance. That's the price at which the stock will trade in the good state at t equals 1, backing up to t equals 0. We don't know that the good state will come about for sure. It'll only come about with probability pi, but we know what the price of the stock will be in the good state. Similarly, PB is something that we know. It's the price of the stock in the bad state. 1 plus RF, that's known as well. That's 1 plus the risk-free rate. K, that's the strike price associated with the option. That is known as well at time zero when the investor purchases that stock option. So the only things that are unknown in these equations are S and B, the positions in the stock and the bond that one must take to form this portfolio. Two equations and two unknowns, and what's more, we never see S or B squared. We never see the logarithm of S or B or the exponential function taken at S or B. It's just S or B by themselves. These are linear equations, and you can verify that both of these equations will be satisfied when S is equal to 1 and B is equal to minus K over 1 plus RF. 
So what this solution tells us is that to replicate with a portfolio of the stock and the bond, the payouts on an option that will be in the money regardless of whether the good state or the bad state comes about. What we need to do is to purchase one share of stock and to take a short position in the bond, which as we've discussed before in other examples, means borrowing basically the amount k over one plus rf at time zero having to pay back k dollars at time one since we know how many shares of stock we need to buy and how much we need to borrow in order to buy this portfolio or assemble this portfolio we can also calculate the cost of the portfolio one share of stock costs p0 and if we borrow k over 1 plus rf we get k plus over 1 plus rf dollars back the cost of assembling the portfolio is p0 minus k over 1 plus rf but what does this solution tell us not just about the price of the portfolio but the price of the option because the payoffs provided by the option and the portfolio are exactly the same, a no arbitrage argument will tell us that if the option, the stock, and the bond are all traded simultaneously, the price of the option must be equal to the price of assembling the portfolio. If the option was cheaper than anyone holding the stock and the bond in the proportions given by the portfolio would sell the stock and the bond that is sell the portfolio and buy the option and thereby pocket the difference get the same payout at time t equals one if the option were more expensive than the portfolio of the stock and the bond then the thing to do would be to sell or write the option and buy the portfolio in equilibrium it has to be the case that the prices are uh, equal the price of the option is equal to the cost of assembling the portfolio down at the bottom v0 equals p0 minus k over 1 plus rf now notice that the price of an option is not equal to the expected value of the uh, payoff thrown off by the option as of period t equals zero for the same reason that the stock price is not going to be the expected value of its payoff both both prices need to be adjusted for risk yet this clever use of the no arbitrage argument which was actually an argument developed by merton in that second paper as opposed to black and shoals initially in their original one we can price the option without having to make any assumptions about risk risk aversion or notice the probabilities don't figure into the formula for the option price either we don't have to even know the probabilities why is that all of the information regarding risk risk aversion probabilities and so forth has already been incorporated into the stock price p0 and will thereby be reflected as well in the price of the option now, so far, we found the price of an option in the special case, if you will, where we know in advance that the stock or the option will be in the money no matter what, looking ahead from period t equal 0 to t equal 1. For future reference, let's write the solution for the option in this first case in a slightly more general form. It's the form given by the equation on the middle of this next slide. V0 is equal to N1 times P0 minus N2 times K over 1 plus RF, where in this special case, the coefficients N1 and N2 are both equal to 1. What we're going to see is that this general formula for the price of the option arises again and again. And as a matter of fact, the Black-Scholes formula has this exact same form, except the coefficients in each of the other cases will be somewhat different. Here, N1 and N2 are both equal to one. That applies in the special case where there are just two states looking ahead from time zero to time one, and where we know in advance, we may not know whether the good or the bad state will come about, but we know in advance that in either state or in both states, the call will expire in the money at time one. 
But now let's consider another case where the call will be in the money in the good state because the stock price has risen above the strike price K. Therefore, the call in the good state will provide the payout PG minus K shown at the bottom of the slide. But let's imagine that the stock price in the bad state is below the strike price for the option so that the option will expire worthless out of the money in the bad state. The payoff provided by the call will therefore just be zero. Here's the event tree in the second case. We don't know the right price to pay for the option in this case, so V0 is set equal to question mark. But we do know that with probability pi, the stock price PG will be above the strike price and will get the positive payoff CG, but in the bad state, the call will expire out of the money because the price of the stock is below the strike price. The payout on the option CB is equal to zero. Once again, we want to find a portfolio, a combination of stock and bond holdings that will replicate the payout made by the option. In this particular case, the positive amount PG minus K shown in the table at the top of this slide in the good state, zero in the bad. If we form a portfolio consisting of S shares and B bonds that replicates the portfolio, S and B have to satisfy the two equations shown at the bottom of this slide. Remember, PG and PB are known. You don't know the price of the stock at time one, at time zero, but you do know what the price would be in the good and the bad state. You know the risk-free rate RF, and you know the option strike price K, the only things that are not known are how many shares you have to buy and how many bonds you have to hold in order to exactly replicate the payouts from the option in the two states in this particular case. Once again, we have a system of two equations and two unknowns that also happens to be a system of linear equations in the two unknowns, S and B. You can solve this system by elimination or substitution and find the solution shown at or in the middle uh, of this particular slide. S, as it turns out, is equal to PG minus K over PG minus PB, and B is given by the formula shown also on the middle of this slide. Notice that in this particular case, we are assuming that the option will be in the money in the good state. So PG minus K is positive, and PG minus PB is also a positive number. The good state is good because the stock price is higher in the good state. So we're buying the stock. And if you take a look at what the signs of the various objects are in the numerator and the denominator and the expression for bond holdings, you find once again that this portfolio asks you to take a short position in the bond, which we can interpret as a, a situation where you've got to borrow at the risk-free rate in order to assemble this portfolio. We can calculate the cost of assembling the portfolio. That's what's being done with the equation down at the bottom of the slide. You're buying S shares, where the solution for S is given in the middle of the slide, paying P0 for each share, and you're borrowing uh, the amount of uh, bonds shown uh, in the middle of the slide, so you're getting that uh, many dollars back at time zero. I've rearranged the formula for B ever so slightly moving from the middle of the slide down to the bottom so as to put this expression, this formula for the option price, in the same form that we had before, where it is uh, a number times P0 times uh, or minus a number times K over 1 plus RF. And again, what we're calculating at the bottom of the previous slide is the cost of assembling the portfolio of the stock and the bond, which replicates the payouts from the option. But then a no arbitrage argument will once again imply that that has to be the option price too. And again, notice that we don't need to make any assumptions about risk or risk aversion 
to do this and as a matter of fact to compute the value of the option in this particular case we don't even need to know the probabilities of the two states all of that information does get reflected in the price of the option but it gets reflected in the price of the option because the price of the option at time zero depends on the price of the stock at time zero and information about risk risk aversion and probabilities will be incorporated or reflected in the price Price of the stock itself. So once again, I've rearranged the formula so that in this particular case, where the option is in the money in the good state and out of the money in the bad, we can write it in the same general form that we had before, a number n1 times p0 minus a number n2, a coefficient n2 times k over 1 plus rf. The general solution for the option price has the same formula or same form as before, uh, but the coefficients n1 and n2 are different. Remember in the previous case where we knew the option would be in the money regardless, n1 and n2 were equal to 1. Here they're equal to positive numbers, but not necessarily equal to 1. And as a matter of fact, if you care to do the algebra, what you'll find is that both n1 and n2 happen to lie between 0 and 1. And you can figure this out by using the assumptions that the price in the good state of the stock PG is greater than the price in the bad state PB, and that the strike price lies in between the stock price in the good state and the stock price in the bad state. We know that because we've assumed that the option is in the money in the good state and out of the money in the bad state at time t equals 1. So there are a couple of more cases that we, we may wish to consider. One might be where the call is in the money in the bad state and out of the money in the good state. We can rule that case out, though, if we simply assume that what makes the good state good is that the price of the stock is higher in the good state than in the bad state. So it can't possibly be that the call option is in the money in the bad state and out of the money in the good state. But there is another case that we do need to consider, and that's the case where the call option expires out of the money no matter what in both states at time t equals 1. This case, however, is particularly easy to deal with because in that case, the call option is going to expire worthless no matter what happens at time t equals 1. No one's going to pay anything for that call option going back to time 0, or another way of saying the same thing, slightly more long-winded but consistent with what we did before, would be to say, well, in this case, the options payouts can be replicated by a portfolio, so, so to speak, consisting of no shares of stock and no bonds, a portfolio that also yields a payoff of zero no matter what, but which also costs nothing at time zero. Either way, we're taking a look at an asset or a portfolio that pays off nothing and has a price of zero at time zero. But if we wish, we can cast the solution in this final case into the same general form as uh, the form of the general solutions in the first case where the option is in the money no matter what in the second case where the option is in the money only in the good state and not in the bad we could still write v0 is equal to n1 times p0 minus n2 times k over 1 plus rf where in this particular case n1 is equal to 0 and n2 is equal to 0 as well so in all three cases we have a general formula for the option price v0 equals n1 times p0 minus n2 times k over 1 plus rf, where in all three cases, n1 and n2 both lie between 0 and 1. So here is that uh, general solution. We've now seen that in a simple two-date, two-state setting, so to speak, the options price is always going to equal v0 uh, equal to n1 times p0 minus n2 times k over 1 plus rf, where n1 and n2 are coefficients that lie between 0 and 1 and depend on the likelihood that the call 
either will be in or out of the money when it expires. That is, the right values to assign to N1 and N2 depend on whether the call will be in the money for sure, in the money in the good state, out in the bad state, or out of the money for sure at time one. Now, Black, Scholes, and Merton considered a much richer and realistic model, so to speak, in, in, in which instead of just saying, well, you buy the option today, you hold it for a year, and you decide whether or not to exercise, depending on whether it is or is not in the money a year from now, instead they considered a, a multi-period model, so where you buy the option at time zero and hold it until it expires, perhaps, at uh, time capital T, and they also allowed for many uh, more than two possible states of the world to come about between today and the time at which the, uh, the stock or the option rather finally expires. So you don't just have a good state or a bad state. The stock doesn't just go up by a lot or up by a little or up or down. You could have a wide variety of outcomes. The stock could go up by a lot, down by a lot, there could be a whole wide variety of uh, outcomes in between. In order to uh, accommodate the possibility of just more than two states looking ahead uh, over the period spanned by the lifetime of the option, however, Black and Scholes needed to solve a, a technical problem. And the technical problem is that with more than two states of the world looking ahead from time zero to time capital T, in general, you would need more than two assets in order to create the portfolio with the same number of payoffs as the option. The stock and the bond alone aren't going to do the trick. Black and Scholes, and in particular Merton, realized, however, that this problem could be finessed or solved by breaking the full period, ranging from zero to capital T, into a whole bunch of subperiods, so that moving between each subperiod, there are only two possible outcomes. The stock could go up or the stock could go down. So in this diagram, you could see how this potentially works. Between zero and half times, so to speak, capital T over two, maybe the stock goes up, maybe the stock goes down. And then in the second half, again, the stock could go up or down again, up or down again. We've got three possible outcomes at the end, but portrayed as unfolding over a series of two stages, during each of which you can think of there being a good state and a bad state emerging within that sub-stage. Now, with three states at time capital T, you only need two sub-periods. That's what's shown here. But of course, when you have many, many states at capital T, you need to break the full period spanned by the lifetime of the asset up into many, many subperiods. But the idea remains exactly the same. Just a good state and a bad state at each step along the way, but by layering on or laddering on many, many subperiods, by the end of the horizon, you can allow for an arbitrarily large number of uh, states. Because moving from one subperiod to the next, there are only two possible outcomes the stock goes up or the stock goes down. You can replicate the payouts on the option in between each of the two subperiods by holding a portfolio of only two assets, the underlying stock itself and a risk-free bond. But in order to uh, implement what you might call a dynamic hedging strategy, you're going to have to adjust your holdings of the stock and the bond at each step along the way to make sure that your portfolio remains in balance with the portfolio that you need to replicate the shifting payouts made by the option itself as you move up and down in this complex event tree, multi-stage event tree. 
And while this is a, a very elegant solution to a difficult technical problem, it does highlight one of the key assumptions that underlies the full-blown Black-Scholes formula with multiple periods and multiple states. What Black-Scholes and Merton have to assume is that it's possible for traders to trade continuously in the stock in the bond at prices that can move over time, including move between sub-periods, but they have to be able to trade continuously at prices that don't jump discontinuously, so to speak, higher or lower. They have to move smoothly in some sense over time. So this is a key assumption that underlies the Black-Scholes option pricing formula. You need to be able to trade continuously in the stock and in a risk-free bond in order to maintain this dynamic hedging strategy in order to maintain the portfolio that successfully replicates the payouts on the option. And to the extent that that is impossible, because let's say there is a financial crisis or some temporary disruption of financial markets, this dynamic hedging strategy will no longer be feasible in practice, and the Black-Scholes option pricing formula under such circumstances may no longer give accurate results. The mathematics in this particular case get considerably more difficult as well, even with the simplifying assumption of breaking the big uh, capital T periods into a sequence of two of uh, equal of uh, various sub-periods where there are only two possible outcomes in each step along the way. In order to come up with the correct option pricing formula in this particular case, Black, Scholes, and Merton had to use methods in the area of mathematics called stochastic calculus developed by the Japanese mathematician Ko uh, Kiyoshi Ito in the 20th century, in particular in the 1940s and early 1950s. But remarkably, using these methods, what Black, Scholes, and Merton showed is that the option pricing formula still takes exactly the same general form that we derived earlier in our simple two-state two example where the price of the option v0 is equal to some coefficient n1 times p0 minus another coefficient n2 times k over 1 plus rf, where the coefficients lie between 0 and 1. In particular, what they showed is that the coefficients n1 and n2 ultimately depend on the formulas shown in the uh, middle of this slide and relate in particular to the cumulative distribution function of the normal of a, a normal random variable. So the equation looks somewhat complicated, but if you know a little bit about using Excel, let's say there is an Excel function that allows you to evaluate the normal cumulative distribution function. This is a formula that looks, it's certainly a little more complicated than the ones that we derived from uh, our simple examples, but it uh, is not one that is terribly onerous to implement in practice. You can just plug the numbers in to formulas in Excel and uh, simply calculate the relevant coefficients using the logarithm function, information on the price of the stock P0 today, the stock uh, strike price for the option K, RF is the risk-free rate, sigma is the standard deviation of the return on the stock, which is assumed to be constant over time. That's another assumption built into the Black-Scholes formula that volatility is not time-varying, it remains constant over time. Capital T is the length of time measuring the, the lifetime of the option between today and the time that it expires. And uh, again, the uh, functions f uh, listed up uh, in the formulas for n1 and n2 just below the original formula for, for uh, uh, v0, those are just the so-called cumulative prob uh, distribution function for the normal distribution, the standard normal distribution, that's a normally distributed variable with mean zero and variance or standard deviation equal to one. And so the Black-Scholes formula gives us 
Another tool for operationalizing the approach pioneered later or developed later by Bonds and Miller, Breeden and Litzenberger for calculating contingent claims prices for the actual US economy. With the caveat that you do need to make extra assumptions, the assumptions made by Black, Scholes and Merton, continuous trading, the ability to trade continuously in the stock and the bonds so as to implement the dynamic hedging strategy the assumption that volatility of the stock remains constant over time, although there are generalized versions of the black scholes merton formula that allow for variation over time in volatility. But in practice, how can one compute contingent claim prices for the actual U.S. economy? Start by choosing a broad portfolio of stocks like those in the Standard & Poor's 500 that will allow you to approximate the market portfolio as a whole. Then, as we discussed in uh, part two of this presentation, construct a grid for the range of possible future values of the portfolio with a constant interval delta in between the value of the index or the price or the cost of the portfolio in between states where they're ranked from the worst to the best. Then using the Black-Scholes formula, you can infer the price of call options on the portfolio for all of the strike prices on the grid. And then finally, you can use the formulas that we derived in part two to go from those option prices to contingent claim prices for the United States. And you can do that with arbitrary amounts of accuracy that is allowing for an arbitrarily large number of states of the world between today and the end of your investment horizon, dozens, hundreds, or perhaps literally thousands if you uh, want to do all of the necessary computations. Just one final use of the Black-Scholes option pricing formula is noted on this last slide. Another valuable application of the Black-Scholes formula stems from the fact that all of the inputs that you have to feed into this formula, P0, the initial price of the share of stock or the initial level of the stock index K, the strike price RF, that's the risk-free rate, and T, that's the time between today and the time at which the option will call option will eventually expire they're all observable except for sigma that's the standard deviation that you assume for the uh, price of the stock or the return on the stock going forward so what this means is that we can go in either of two directions if you want to price an option that is not yet traded. You can make an assumption about the volatility of the stock price, or you can estimate the volatility of the stock price and calculate what the option price should be. Or if you've got an option that's already traded, so you can see the price at which it's being traded for, you can use the Black-Scholes formula to back out an estimate of what the stock price volatility sigma is most likely to be. And some of you may have heard of the VIX volatility index. This is not exactly an estimate of the sigma from the Black-Scholes formula, but it's very similar in spirit and computed in a very similar way by reversing an option pricing formula using the information, in other words, embedded into options prices to draw inferences about how volatile prices of the underlying stocks like the S&P 500 are likely to be.